Oh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we get started this morning. Um, you know, about uh, the month, uh, Sunday school, 1015, uh, we're, we're studying Judges and uh, studying, uh, started studying about Samson this morning, so I encourage you to come uh, a few minutes early to, to study God's Word with us. Uh, Bible study Wednesday 6 p.m. We are um, actually we need to uh, pick something new because we finished uh, the book of Acts so I have until Wednesday to figure out <laughs> what the next one is but uh, come study with us a uh, wonderful time of fellowship and, and um, prayer and, and learning um, soul winning God, uh, we're not going to go uh, my diverticulitis is acting up and um, uh, praise God that I'm here today because yesterday didn't look like I was going to be anywhere, except in heaven. <laughs> That's how bad I felt anyhow. Uh, but um, uh, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll still win next week. Uh, although, they're going to go uh, do some singing, right? Uh, Jess is doing uh, over at uh, the nursing home, and, and you're going to sing and also maybe we might talk to the folks about the gospel and all that. That'd be nice. And then uh, Vacation Bible School, July 15th to the 18th. 5.30 to 8 is coming upon us, and so uh, please make sure that you uh, get the word out and make sure that uh, we're all ready to help out with the effort, and um, uh, so looking forward to that. And then what's not up here, I forgot to put on, uh, is that uh, uh, you might have seen online, we're going to have uh, a Sunday evening concert, um, July the 28th, right, it's the 28th, yeah, at 6 p.m., and so we sure are looking forward to that. Um, uh, as you know, a great time of fellowship and leading you all in, in singing. Amen? The Amen. Lord. So uh, we're, we're preparing for that. Uh, we start preparing for it. Looking forward. Okay, so everyone, please stand and sing Lord's Praise. If uh, anybody can help yeah. out making some posters for Vacation Bible School posters, by what I mean by for in here. We need some for each day. So if, you, if you've got a talent and want to help out with that, I can show you. Yeah, please do. Get ready.
have allowed us to come together this morning to sing songs unto you, to uh, study your word, to be here for each other, to love on each other, uh, to help each other to learn and, and um, to provoke each other into love and to good works. Father, as always, uh, we want uh, every second of the service to be pleasing to you, so please guide us so that it will be. In our Lord Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated.
Okay, prayer meeting Thanksgiving. What do we have? Charles. Uh, you may have heard about a fire on Orchard Street. Fire on? Yeah, I did see some. I did uh, on Orchard Street. Yeah. Yeah, just, just uh, Thursday. Uh, it was my wife's sister's son. Uh, Your wife's sister's son. Yeah, Jeffrey Rice and his uh, wife uh, and four children. Oh my. They got out safe, but uh, the house was pretty ruined. Okay, so number one, let's pray for them, uh, uh, Jeff, Jeffrey Rice and his family, right? And secondly, let's see what we can do to help them, whatever help they need, okay? And we can talk about that, what, what needs they might have and what we might be able to do to help them otherwise. But first and foremost, we pray, amen? Amen. Okay, what else do we have? Peggy. Uh, my nephew... Um doing some texting. Um, I don't really want to get more than that. But we can keep having Preston and my sister. And Preston. Preston, yeah. So, Preston. And also, uh, patience is going to her grandma's in Florida. I'm a little, little nervous. <laughs> oh, yeah. When's she headed there? Uh, I think... Wednesday or Thursday? Wednesday. Yeah. She, she's flying down there? Yeah. Okay. Oh. She's flying down with the grandma, but then when she comes back, the grandma's going somewhere else. So her and her cousin got to fly back by themselves. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Made me a little, little nervous. Yeah. I've seen that. You know, I, I used to fly a lot, you know, regularly, and I saw that a lot. And they, they take good care of them. Yeah. Yeah. But the Lord will take you better care of them. So. Yeah. So let's pray for patience. Mm -hmm. Traveling. Florida. How long are they going to be down there? Uh, like a week. Yeah, like a week. A week? Okay. Yeah. I'll get that. I think Wednesday or Thursday. Something like that. <laughs> 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 uh, all right. Great. Dan. Dan. Uh, make sure everybody prays for you that you get some relief and start feeling Oh, better, yeah, you know? thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, if you would pray for me for this uh, diverticulitis business. I uh, finally got the right antibiotic started yesterday. I was not in good shape yesterday. I'll tell you right now, Sandy will tell you. Yes, Virgil. Uh, I still need the prayers. Uh, now they're checking me for uh, my blood count's low. I don't know. They think I don't know if checking me for leukemia. For leukemia? But yeah, so your, your platelets have been low, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, Virgil, checking for leukemia. There ain't one thing to another with me. I don't know what's going on. I understand, brother. Believe me. I'm 64 and everything just stopped out. <laughs> I say that about 60. So actually, I said that about, 70, I said that about 40. 50 and 40. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but we still got to be, um, yeah. praise the Lord for um, the testing of his heart and stuff. It, it was pretty bad. Yeah, so praise the Lord for that, huh? Yes. Yeah, so that, like that came. Whatever they seem disappeared, whatever. Oh, good. Well, praise God for that. Because we're praying. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, yeah let, look, let's not be surprised when we pray and then God uh, yeah, gives us what we're at. But that's the first time it happened to me. You know what I mean? They're telling me something's wrong, then yeah. all of a sudden there's nothing. nothing. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, whoa. Yeah, yeah. right. But yeah, that's not right. But it's, yeah. So uh, let's pray for it. I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah. And for him, it's nothing. Right? So uh, let's pray for Virgil. So they're checking you for leukemia. Dr. K, the same doctor I have, right? Yeah, Dr. Kaparov. Yeah, I like her a lot. So let's pray uh, that the uh, Lord will heal whatever it is that's causing the low platelets. All right, what else? Yes, Carol. For my shoulder. Carol, for her shoulder. And for the test for my lung on my head. And uh, yeah, CT scan lung. 
you're having that tomorrow, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's pray for that. Dan. Do I get another one? Yeah, yeah. Since, since, the first, since the first one was for me, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, pray for Sandy and Jessica. Maybe somebody will get saved. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Jess, saved. that's a wonderful thing to do, Jess. Um, so, um, Yeah, for sure. Anything else? Let's pray for our VBS, huh? That the Lord will send a lot of kids and that uh, we'll teach them correctly and love on them and all of that. Pray for the church. Yeah, you know, I was just about to say, if you take the word right, let's pray for, continue to pray for our church, that people will be dedicated to, you know, serving uh, the Lord through our church and, and um, you know, First and foremost, through leading people to Christ, and then building everybody up in the faith, and and all of that, yeah. And um, so let's uh, let's pray for our church, and that um, you know, you know that he he guide us in wherever we end up being. You know, uh, um, you know I can tell you that um, a week ago this past Friday, someone looked at the building, you know, in terms of like seeing if they wanted to buy it. You know, uh, Paul gave me the heads up on that, and, but I haven't heard anything since. You know, so it's just hard to tell, you know, um, uh, you know, when and where or whatever, but just we need to have God guide us, that's all. Keep praying, okay? okay. He's taking care of us this far. Right? Yeah. Right. Anything else? Okay, well then let's pray. Well, then let's pray for Rob too. He was in the hospital, right? And, yeah, yeah. and praise God, he's he's doing well. And so, so let's pray. Continue to pray for Rob. All right, so let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for all that you do for us, and uh, we praise you, Lord, for our church family. We praise you um, for um, our little ones, and their parents, and. and uh, all who uh, give of their time to serve and 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 to help and uh, with the various things going on and and um, Father, we know that you have heard the, the various needs, uh, many of them physical needs, and and we ask Lord that if it be your will that you heal every one of their physical problems and and help people, uh, Lord. We ask you who may, with the unspoken ones, often which are our emotional uh, concerns and, and uh, sometimes addictions and all those things. And we ask you to heal them all to your glory as well. And to use these situations to show people who aren't involved, I mean, who are involved, who aren't saved, their need for salvation, that there's only one way to you, and that is by believing on your son as we're going to study this morning. And, and uh, Father, please... Uh, uh, watch over the junior church teachers so that uh, uh, please give them uh, the, the patience and the, uh, you know, to, uh, to work with the children and to teach them well, Lord, and uh, to teach them correctly and help these children to be attentive and well behaved. And Father, please guide me so that uh, I, everything that comes out of my mouth during the sermon uh, is indeed uh, exactly according to your word. Uh, and that uh, we live by the truths that you teach us. In our words, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. Junior Church. Church, but you might get mad at me. <laughs> I said I'm pretty junior. <laughs> yeah. You're still on the junior side. All right. Okay, everyone uh, have a bulletin, Bible. All right. Well, uh, today we are continuing this morning our sermon series, the, the Book of John. 
And the title of the message this morning is Born Again. Born Again. And I put this in your sermon notes. I said this. Today's scripture is among the most famous in all of the Bible. And that we certainly use these verses when we're sharing the gospel with people, when we're soul winning, trying to help people to get saved. You know, I remember growing up Catholic, Roman Catholic, and into my adulthood, I would hear these non-Catholics um, who called themselves Christians talk about being born again, right? They said they were born again Christians. And being a good Catholic, I had no idea what that meant. Uh, I had no idea what this born again stuff was. You know, I was like Nicodemus that we're going to study about this morning. He and his fellow leaders thought that you had to be a well-behaved Jew to go to heaven. And I thought I had to be a well-behaved Catholic to go to heaven. And so since these, you know, in, my, in that mentality I had, since these born-again goofs weren't Catholic... There was no way they were going to heaven. You see? The arrogance of that. Boy, did I have that backwards. Some people, uh, someone told me the other day, as a matter of fact, you, did anybody see uh, on, online, I put, uh, you know, if you're not born again, uh, you can't go to heaven, period. You know, that kind of, something like that, I forget. And someone had messaged me and said um, that, uh, they thought they were born again because they were confirmed in the Roman Catholic Church. And I said, no, all, all that confirmed is that you believe the Roman Catholic doctrine. Uh, I was confirmed and I was nowhere, I wasn't saved at all, right? I mean, not like you could be saved a little bit, but I wasn't saved. You know, not till uh, I understood the gospel and believed it, okay? So confirmation doesn't do anything except Confirm that you believe false doctrine. That's what that means. Okay. All right. So please turn to John chapter 3 then. And we will learn about this born again business. Okay. Everyone there? All right. Verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler. Now notice this now. A ruler of the Jews. And the same came to Jesus by night. And said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. And we are getting feedback, so I'll turn this off. Somebody was, yeah, that sounds like a hearing aid, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, that, so, so no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And so we have this interesting thing right away. And I put this in your, your notes. Nicodemus is a ruler of the Jews, and he's basically speaking for them, right? And he says, look, we, we know that you're, uh, you're a teacher come from God because no man can do these miracles that you've been doing. You know, unless God is with them. But notice he comes at night, right? He doesn't want people to see that he's approached our Lord. And as we go through the book of John, we're going to see over and over again that the leadership of the Jews, you know, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, they don't believe on the Lord Jesus. Not at all. They're publicly very negative toward him. But notice he's coming to him secretly and saying, well, we know that your teacher has come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And in fact, later on, we're going to see that, you know, they, they actually bring this up, the fact that the rulers don't believe them, believe the <coughs> Lord, right? So he secretly comes to him and admits there's something about this guy. You know, God must be with him somehow, otherwise he wouldn't be able to do these things. 
So notice how our Lord Jesus answers him. He says this, Jesus had answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, uh, by the way, let me ask you something. Did uh, Jesus seem to um, hesitate there? Did he stutter or stammer in any way when he said this? Right? Did he beat around the bush when he said this? This is a pretty direct statement, is it not? Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So I grew up in this as a, for years into my adulthood. They never talked about being born again once. Except to stay away from those who say they're born again. So you would think if they you know, really, if it really mattered to them about salvation, that they would have talked about being born again. Because right here it says, unless you're born again, you're not going to heaven. And so what's going on in this interaction with Nicodemus is that he's saying there's something about you, you know, because uh, you're doing these miracles, you know, you must be a teacher sent from God. And how does our Lord reply? Buddy, you're not even saved. You're not saved. None of you are saved. You see? So apparently there's a difference between just kind of knowing that Jesus was sent from God. You know, having this intellectual assent of the facts and actually being saved. Okay? So that's why I put this in your bulletin. Knowing that Jesus is a teacher come from God or that he did miracles or that he died on the cross or was buried and rose again is not enough. Just knowing those facts. The devil knows those facts. An intellectual assent of facts is not enough to be saved. You actually have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. You see? And that means you put your full faith and trust in the Lord Jesus as your Savior. You put your complete trust in what He did on the cross for you, relying on your own works. Not at all, you see. Or your adherence to the law. Or some religious practices like going through the sacraments. You see? All of that. So, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ means trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. Putting all your faith in Him. That He did what was necessary for you to be saved. And all you have to do is that accept that free gift by trusting Him. That's all. So you might wonder, well, if Nicodemus knows that the Lord Jesus is a teacher sent from God, why doesn't he believe on Him? Right? I mean, he has the Lord Jesus standing right in front of him. He's talking to him. He is aware of these miracles. Why doesn't he believe on Him? And it's, there's a simple answer. It's his will. His own will. Nicodemus's will. He did not want to believe on the Lord Jesus. The rulers did not want to believe on the Lord Jesus. They could not deny the miracles, but they could refuse to believe that he's the Son of God. You see? And we're going to address that a little bit. But they didn't want to believe on the Lord Jesus. And the main reason they did not want to believe on the Lord Jesus was because they wanted to be the top dogs. You see? They've been teaching a certain way, and they didn't want to admit that what they were teaching was wrong. These were prideful people who believed that they were going to go to heaven because they were so good. They were so righteous. Matter of fact, they even created rules that God didn't. To try to be more righteous than God. So they want to earn their way into heaven. And there's a lot of pride in that, right? That's why Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 said, you know, it's not of works lest any man should boast. 
Because God knew if it were up to us, if the reason we went to heaven is because we're so good, we would surely <coughs> boast about it, wouldn't we? Rather than them accepting the free gift of salvation. So how does our Lord answer this? Look, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And by the way, this is a good tip, and I put this in your bulletin. When someone comes to you and they're not saved and they ask you questions about religion, about Christ, about Christianity, or they want to talk to you about the Bible, I said, find a way to get on the subject of salvation because that's what people really need, right? You know, they could try to talk, you know, you know what about Noah and the flood? Or what about this? Or what about that? And it won't matter what you say to them anyhow because, you know, uh, uh, the natural man doesn't, right, can't understand these things. They have to be born again. So you can go into all sorts of dissertations. It will not matter. Focus on them getting saved first. Then they can start understanding these things. So you can spend hours on all sorts of things. Hours on doctrine. You know, someone asks you, go, well, why do you dunk people? And isn't it enough just to sprinkle them at all? No. Wrong discussion. Let's talk about salvation first. Then we can talk about <coughs> baptism. So always try to direct them to salvation. Let's get that straight first. Okay? So our Lord says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In order to go to heaven... In order to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. And so what does that mean? I put this in your book. The first time you were born, you were born to your earthly human parents, right? That's the first birth. And then when you're born again, you become a child of God. And so we've already seen this. You might remember this from John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as receive him the Lord Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So we saw this a couple of weeks ago, right? Where you don't, and we've talked about this many times, actually, where uh, you know, the, the world wants to say, oh, we're all children of God. No, we are all not. The Bible tells us that. To be a son of God, you have to believe on the Son. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Period. And that is the second birth. That is being born again. Okay. So look at verse 4. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Nicodemus completely misses what the Lord is saying, right? I mean, it went right over his head. Why? Because he's not saved. Because of his lack of faith, because he refuses to believe, it just goes right over his head. He doesn't understand it. So what does he end up doing? He asks a silly, ridiculous question. Well, what are you talking about here? You, you mean it's, it's possible for an old guy like me to go back into his mother's womb and be born again? And so look at verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now notice verse 6, right? You see what verse 5 just said? Now notice verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. As we're going to see here in a second, that's connected to verse 5. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Now, first of all, notice it says born again, right? It doesn't say born again and again and again and again. You must be born again, period. So what does that tell you? If you must be born again, how many times are you born again? Once, right? One time we need to be born again. We were born into our earthly family, and now we need to be born into God's family. 
And notice what it says here. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Okay. So when you were born of your mother and father, you were born of the flesh. When you become born again by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, you become born of the spirit. Okay. You're spiritually born. That's pretty easy to understand, is it not? But here's where people will twist this. And, and this is what they'll say about verse 5. You know, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And they will try to tell you that this is referring to baptism. That the being born of water refers to baptism. But notice what I put in your bulletin. Being born of water is not referring to baptism because the water birth is referring to the physical birth. So what do we do? We let the Bible define itself. And this is why I said 5 and 6 are connected. Look at 5 and 6 again. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter in the kingdom of God. Okay, now, then look at verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. What is that connected to? The water. That which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. What is that connected to? The Spirit. So you notice how water is replaced by flesh, right? And, but, and this is a very common thing in the Bible that we call parallelism. And this, we see this throughout the Bible, these parallels, and it helps, the, helps us to know what's going on, what, what the, God is talking about, because the Bible is defining the Bible. So when the Bible talks about born of water, it's talking about being born of the flesh, not getting dunked. Okay? And so why do we have to be born of the water? Well, because we're not going to be born physically if we're not born of water. And why do we have to be born of the Spirit? Because we're not going to heaven if we're not born of the Spirit. So I put this in your bulletin as well. Now, why would be being born of the flesh be called being born of water? Well, because as we know, when a woman gives birth, her water breaks, right? So what happens? So until we're born, we're in a sack of water, the amniotic fluid, right? We're in a sack of water. And so how do we come to this earth? We burst forth into this world, you know, through the water. You see the point? That's what it means when it says born of water. That's, and then there's the spiritual birth. You know, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So the moment you, you accepted that free gift of salvation, you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you were born of the Spirit. All right, so don't let anybody tell you that being born of the water means baptism and that you have to be baptized to be saved. If they say that, they have no more understanding than Nicodemus. And so that's not what this is talking about here. The Bible defines itself. The Bible saying being born of the water means flesh. Okay? All right, verse 8. The wind bloweth where it, it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Okay, so here now the Lord is using an analogy of the wind blowing it, right? And one of the things we know about the wind is you cannot see the wind. Uh, you can see the effects of the wind, like you can see, um, like we saw out here, look, you can see out there right now, you know, the, the, the trees blowing, like when there's a storm coming, well, there must be a storm coming. You know, you can't see the wind, but you can see the effect of the wind. You can see a flag, you know, flapping and all that. You don't see the wind, you see the effect of the wind. But looking at the wind itself isn't really going to tell you much about the wind, right? Uh, but you can see the effect of it. And so the same is the case with being born again, being born of the Spirit. Is that you can't look at someone and tell if they're saved or not. Now, there are a lot of, of uh, church-going types that will try to tell you that. 
You know, if someone doesn't show up in a suit and a tie and this and that, yeah, they must not be saved. And you know what that is? Baloney. Right? It's, it's nonsense. Or if you see somebody walking out of a bar, they must not be saved. That's nonsense. Because what happens when a person is saved? It's a change of heart, right? Mm -hmm. And you can't see their heart. You can't see their spirit, whether it's alive or dead. You can't see that. But we could hear someone say, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe the gospel. And this is what the gospel says. And it's pretty clear that they really understand it. And, you know, they're saying, I put all my trust in what the Lord Jesus did on the cross. I'm not trusting myself at all in any way to try to work my way into heaven. You know, it's pretty likely that they're saved if they say that. You know, or maybe, um, you know, there's some kind of transformation in their life along with that, that you say, yeah, this person's probably saved. But we cannot know for sure, right? The only one you can know for absolute certain that they're saved is your own, your own self, right? You know for sure whether you believe or not. Now, it doesn't mean we don't ever doubt here and there, but you know for sure whether you believe the gospel, whether you're saved. You know, sometimes we succumb to our flesh and do pretty sinful things, but that doesn't mean we're not saved. You know, so someone asked me, how do you know if somebody's saved? And what, nine times out of ten, what will people do? They will look at someone's actions, won't they? Well, do they go to church? Do they do this? Do they do that? I mean, that, that is, that's just wrong. I want to ask them, do you believe the gospel? Do you know what the gospel is? Someone explains the gospel to me and tells me they believe it, you know, with all their heart. That is, I mean, you can't compare that to, well, I go to church on Sunday, or I do this, or I do that. You see my point? So there's not this outward, you know, obvious thing. And that's why the Lord is making this analogy to the wind. You know, you can't see the wind either. You can only see the effects from it. Okay? So there could be people who we think are saved who actually aren't. <clears throat> And there could be people who we think aren't saved who actually are. Okay? So verse 9. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Okay. How could these things be? He asked him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel? And knowest not these things? Now keep in mind, the, the, these rulers, these teachers, you know, these, uh, these leaders thought really highly of themselves. You know, they thought they were it all, you know. They're not used to being talked to this way. And he said, you're, you're a master of Israel and you don't know these things. And you know why he didn't know these things? Because he didn't know the most basic truth. And that is how to get to heaven in that there's only one way, and that is by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, by being born again. And let me tell you something. Today, there are all kinds of pastors and preachers and evangelists and televangelists and radio evangelists and you know people with uh, uh, theology, master's degrees and doctoral degrees and all of that that people really turn to and ask questions about and, Listen to the uh, must know what he's talking about because he's on the radio. You know, must know what he's talking about because he wrote a book. That aren't even saved. That aren't even saved. Because, for example, they're teaching, um, you know, uh, they're, they're teaching something like, um, you know, you have to repent of your sins to be saved. You know what I mean? That, that, um, Lordship salvation business. Okay. But but yet, what do they do? Or what might they do? Sneak up to Jesus in the middle of the night. You know, what you talking about, Jesus? 
Amen? And so Nicodemus, Jesus tells Nicodemus, how can you even lead when you're not even saved? You don't even understand salvation. And that's why our Lord Jesus over and over again calls them blind leading the blind. You know, it says that, you know, if they're both blind, they're going to go off a cliff, right, into a ditch. The Pharisees, the scribes, you know, these Jewish leaders were just not saved. So why is it called being born again? Well, we've already talked about the fact that when, when you're saved, you, you're born into the family of God, right? But also, you know, you realize that uh, we have a body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit, right? And so before a person is saved, their spirit is dead. Before you were saved, your spirit, my spirit, was dead. But then when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, our spirit, the Bible says, uh, was quickened. You know, became alive. Was resurrected. But now understand, too, that it's resurrected and it's different. We're a new creature in Christ, the Bible tells us. Okay? And the resurrection of Christ pictures this. So what happened? After the Lord Jesus died on the cross, and his body was placed in the tomb, and his body was there for three days, right, and three nights, then his body, he and his body came out of that tomb alive, right? But it was his resurrected body that came out of that tomb alive. And so his resurrected body was different than the body that he had before. The body that he had before was, I mean, it's the same body, but that human body was, um, uh, had the limits that we all have, right? And, and the issues, yet uh, the Lord got hungry. He got thirsty. You know, he got tired. All these various things. But then, after he was resurrected... And he had his resurrected body. Now what, what's going on? Well, he could still eat. Remember, he, he ate fish and all that with him. But now, you remember, his disciples were in the upper room and they had the door locked because they were afraid that they were going to get killed next. And Jesus just comes right through the wall or the door, whatever, in the room. He could do that. He wasn't doing that before, right? But now he could with his new, resurrected, glorified body. And the Bible says that this is what we're going to experience as well. We're, we are, praise God, we're going to have a new, resurrected, uh, glorified body. Okay? Look at 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we be, we ever be with the Lord. Okay? And then, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 through 53, it says, Behold, I show you a, minister, a mystery. I mean, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So, when the Lord returns, there's going to be some Christians who are alive, right? Uh, uh, whereas others, um, you know, have already passed. So we're not all going to be asleep. But in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. There, there cannot be anything corruptible in heaven. There cannot be anything immoral in heaven. Okay? So when we're born again, when we're saved, our spirit is made incorruptible. Our spirit is completely holy and, and you know, justified with the Father and, and all of that. But the body isn't, right? The body doesn't get saved. It's the spirit. The body isn't born again. It's the spirit. And so 
when we receive our glorified bodies, it now will be, uh, you know, incorruptible. It, it will now will be holy. And you know what the good news is? Is we will not be able to sin with that body. You and I will be holy from head to toe. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Amen. 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 Huh? Amen. Yeah. So that's why I put this. And, and, and also, the good news is, you know, if, if you have bad eyes or your hearing's going, you have a bum leg or whatever, that's all going to be fixed. Never an issue like that again. So that's why I put this in your bulletin. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the spirit, the resurrected spirit, the quickened spirit within you is perfect, just like your glorified body someday is going to be perfect. Okay. New creature in Christ. New creation. And so I put this, that is the reason it's called a new birth, because you have this new creature that is born inside of you, your spirit. Your spirit is born again. You're a new creation in Christ. So once we're saved, our spirit is made holy and pure, but we still have this flesh, right? We still have this brain, and this flesh encourages us to sin. This flesh wants us to sin. And unfortunately, sometimes we might use this flesh to sin. So what happens? There's this war that is now raging, as the Bible says. There's this war that's raging between our spirit and our flesh. The flesh wants to, to do wrong. The spirit wants to do right. And so the question is, you know, what are we going to obey? God, you know, the spirit, or are we going to fall for the flesh? So, what happens? The Lord Jesus says, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? And best I can tell, this is the last that we hear from Nicodemus. And so, what is Nicodemus' real problem? Is it that he's this big dummy that just doesn't get it? No. It's that he refuses to believe. He doesn't want to believe. These things are spiritually discerned, and he refuses to to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the problem. He doesn't want to have the faith. He's not willing. Okay. So then look at verse 11. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. So you notice, you know, we're, we're saying, but you're not receiving it. He doesn't say you can't receive it like God's blocked you said, you're not receiving it. I have told you earthly things, ye believe not. How, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? So again, our Lord is hitting the nail right on the head, right? With what his problem was. He doesn't believe the word of God. He's not saved and he doesn't want to be. Verse 13, and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven, and as Moses lift, okay, now get a look at this. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. You know, you have some churches that that say uh, there is ab there is no need to study the Old Testament, and they don't. They only study the New Testament. So therefore, when they come across this, uh, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, they, they, if they have not studied the Old Testament at all, they have no idea what this is about. They have no idea what this means, you know? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So now, so this is Jesus talking to Nicodemus, right? Now, it looks like John, you know, who, the, the narrator here, is now interjecting, okay? And, and adding uh, something else to this. For God so loved the world, the world, not just some of the world, but all of it, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, so now you notice where it says in verse 14, Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man 
Let me lift up. Our Lord Jesus here is prophesying the fact that he's going to be lifted up from the earth as a, as a part of his execution, right? What does that mean? They, when they nailed the Lord Jesus to the cross, they didn't nail him while he was, you know, standing up or something, right? He was lying down, was he not? And they nailed him to the cross. Then what did they do? They lifted him up. They lifted him up. You see? They lifted him up. And so he's, he's prophesying. He's saying, this is how I'm going to die for you. Me lifted up on that cross. And so when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, this was a picture of Jesus dying on the cross. Now you might wonder, well, why would a serpent on a pole be a picture of our Lord Jesus crucified? Normally, serpents are, are uh, symbolic of who? The devil. Right, the devil, Satan, right? So we don't think of him representing Jesus. We think of him representing sin, Satan. Well, look, this is coming from Numbers chapter 21, verses 7 through 9. And the Bible reads, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord, and against thee pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. You know, biting them, right? And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, upon that brazen serpent, right, that fiery serpent, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So when he looked at it, he lived. Now this is the opposite of what you would normally expect God to tell him to do, right? Because normally he would say, no, don't, don't make any kind of image like that at all. Don't, you know, look at it and, you know, you know, have thoughts about it or any of that. But he said, you do this, and if a person's bitten, just look at it, and you're going to be healed. And by the way, there's a, but this parallels or pictures our Lord Jesus, right? And there's a truth in, in this as well. And that is, notice, they didn't have to work to be healed, did they? They just had to look at this brazen serpent, this brass serpent on this, this pole. Well, likewise, all we have to do is look upon the Lord Jesus, believe on him, trust in him, and we are saved, right? We don't do any work, and that's something that, that takes place within us. So I put this in your notes. The reason why it was a serpent is because the Bible says of Jesus, when he was on the cross, he who knew no sin became sin for us. He became sin for us. I put that we might be made the righteousness of God, in, as, as the Bible says. So when the Lord Jesus was nailed to that cross and was on that cross and was basically suffocating, you know, uh, that's how normally people died, is because they couldn't breathe. You know, after on that cross like that. He bore the sins of the world. He bore all of my sins as if he had been the one that committed them. He took all of our sins. And so he's represented by that serpent on the, on the pole. Because at that moment, he was like the epitome of sinfulness on that pole because he had all of the sin of the world on him. You see? Is that making sense to you? He had taken the sin of the world upon him. And so just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man, the Bible said, must be lifted up. Notice that's future tense, right? He's saying that whosoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, not whoever repents of their sins, not whoever cleans up their act, not whoever joins a church, not whoever gets baptized, 
who lives a straight, normal life, but whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay. So then, you know, John jumps in and, and elaborates and you know, makes sure we understand that's because God so loved the world that he sent him to save us. Okay, now look at verse 17. For God, and people will use this to try to twist it around for their own purposes. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, note, notice this here, and especially if you uh, uh, know more about English, you might notice the tense here. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Okay, so the first thing that I want to point out about this is look at verse 18. It says, he that believeth not, right? That is present tense, right? If you don't, those who don't believe, don't believe now. But then it says, is condemned already because he hath not believed. That is past tense, right? So he's saying the reason why you don't believe now is because you haven't believed. You see? You have never believed, and that's why you don't believe now. You know, I uh, heard a political commentator the other day say that uh, she had uh, adopted Judaism. She had converted to Judaism because her husband's Jewish. And she said, I used to be Christian, but I gave it up to be Jewish. And so now I started talking to the TV, as I often do. <laughs> okay. And uh, one of these days it's going to talk back. Uh, <laughs> But so now I'm talking to the television and I'm saying, well, I'm sorry, but if you used to be Christian, you never were Christian. <coughs> you never were. See, she's condemned now because she well, has always been. She doesn't believe now because she never has. That's what the Bible says. Okay. So this idea that you can be saved, that you can believe and be saved, and then stop believing and lose your salvation is about as wrong as anything on this earth is wrong. You don't believe now because if so, if a person doesn't believe now, why is that? Because they have never believed. Okay? And it's funny because people like to use verse 17 in isolation. And what they will say is something like this. You know, we need to stop preaching this negative stuff because Christ didn't come to condemn the world. But you see, they forgot the next verse. The reason Christ didn't come to condemn the world was because the world was already condemned. Amen. And why? Because they, they have not believed. So it's not like, well, you know, uh, Jesus came, he preached to them, and then they were condemned. No, they were already condemned. That's why God sent his only begotten son to save us, because we were already condemned. And by the way, this also speaks to this idea, you know, people will say, well, what about the poor people, you know, in these countries where they've never heard of Jesus? Well, show me one. First of all, I'd like to see the country that has never been exposed to Jesus at all. But secondly, um, what does the Bible tell us? They're already condemned. They, mankind has been condemned since when? Adam. Since the Garden of Eden. And I see nowhere in the Bible does it say except for those in the middle of the jungle. Right? It doesn't say that. That's why Jesus said, go out into the world. <coughs> Preach the gospel. That's why he said that. Okay. 
So they're already condemned. So this whole idea of, oh, well, I think I'm, well, because I'm pretty good, or you're condemned. I was condemned. There's only one way to not be condemned. And that is to put all of your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. for your salvation. Amen? Amen? That's it. That's the only way. So now look at verse 19. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved. <clears throat> but he that doeth truth cometh to the light. Now you notice how on the one hand it says evil, on the other hand it says truth. Because, you know, when, when you read God's word, what is God's word? Truth. And when you are doing it, what are you doing? Acts of righteousness, right? You're obeying it. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. <sighs> Amen. So look, praise God that the gospel was shared with me and now I understand what these born-again goofs were talking about. <laughs> now I'm one of those born-again goofs, praise God. And... Uh, so we need to get the gospel to people. There's only one way. You must be born again. You must put all of your faith in Jesus for your salvation. Because if you try to put even a little bit of faith in yourself, you're making that grace null and void for yourself. The Bible tells us that. Okay. Amen? Amen? All right, well, let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for all that you do for us. We're so grateful for your gospel. We're so grateful that, that you make it clear in your word how to be saved. That you want us to be saved. That you sent your son, your only begotten son, to save us. And uh, you made it crystal clear that salvation is a free gift. And all we have to do is just put our, believe, to just put our trust in you. And, our, and your son and, and what he did on the cross for us and help us Lord to share the gospel with people help us to um, to help them to believe and be born again and uh, Father if there's anybody uh, watching uh, online that, that isn't saved or anyone in this room that doesn't know for sure that when they die they're going to heaven please uh, send them to us. Help us to know it so that uh, we may share the gospel with them and they can be born again. In our Lord Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Super 7, come on. Come on show your... Super 7! Light is so cool because we talked about the light today and I see you all talked about the light too. Amen. Take a look at these beautiful things. Mm. Oh, how nice. There's our verse and then different things about Matthew 14 through 16. Nice job, guys. Make sure you remember those, okay? Great job. 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 Great job.